chapter 2. And um, I can't remember his name. He made some videos that got passed around. These, this was back in the days of uh, VCR tapes. And um, his church was a, what he called a classic Pentecostal church or an old time Pentecostal church. Um, and I talked to him on the phone uh, one afternoon and and just I enjoyed the conversation and um, he he said basically when uh, when there's tongues spoken in his church he said we do it according to the Bible there's one and he said then there might be another one and he said then it's possible that there's a third one but then it's cut off we don't do all of that going all around the church and everybody jabbering and and speaking all this nonsense and he said then we have one interpret and um you know while i disagree with him on what those tongues really are um i appreciated the fact that he was following the scriptures as best as his understanding is and um somebody's probably texting me trying to tell me who it is Come on. I don't care how much weight I've lost today. There we go. Um, but anyway, he made a series of, of tapes uh, exposing Benny Hinn, exposing um, um, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, and those guys, he said that they're practicing wizardry, they're practicing sorcery. And uh, he just came out and just blasted these guys. And I appreciated the stand that he took uh, against these people. He said, that is, that is not the Holy Ghost in them. He said, it is, a, it is a spirit of drunkenness. God has not called us to be drunk. He's called us to be sober. And man, I tell you what, I like that. I liked it. Whatever I made, and they were King James all the way. And whatever, whatever I may disagree with them about, I'm going to leave them alone and uh, let them worship the Lord and, and let him keep doing it. I think he may have gone on to be with the Lord because um, it's been quite a few years and he was an older man uh, by the time I heard him. But anyway, I just enjoyed that, enjoyed the conversation with him. Um, and so Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to begin tonight. And uh, we are going to touch on the issue uh, of tongues and what they are, what it, what it was that was going on here in Acts chapter 2, and why, uh, why was it going on? And that was a question, that, that's something that uh, when God really called me to study the Bible and study uh, concerning prophecy and so on, is, is to not just understand what's happening, but I, I like to know why. Why is God doing it? And if you'll study the scriptures, you'll understand why. God will tell you why he does what he does uh, in his word. And there are some things that, uh, as the Bible says, that are, that are too high for me, for me to understand. They're just way up there. God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts and his ways are higher than my ways. But some things I get. Some things are just as, about as simple as, as a child can understand. And, uh, and so I like to try to keep the Bible 
uh, like that. So let's begin uh, reading tonight. We've got some folks we're going to pray for tonight and uh, lift them up. And so you just kind of keep those in mind, if you would. In Acts uh, chapter 2, uh, now we've, we've dealt with the issue in Acts chapter 1 of the apostleship of Matthias. And again, uh, if, uh, if you're just hearing this tonight, last Wednesday night I gave um, my, uh, my firm belief that Matthias was in fact a true apostle uh, who God called to, to fill the office so that instead of 11, there's going to be 12. Uh, just because this is going to be part of what we're talking about tonight, what does the number 11 mean? Does anybody know? What does 11 mean in the scriptures? Huh? You said that like you didn't know. Confusion? Yeah, that's it. Confusion. It's like the face that you gave me. Confusion? I don't know, maybe? Yeah, that's what it means. And uh, we'll look into that tonight. So the number had to be 12. God had selected 12 tribes. Those tribes, uh, as we looked at last week, are going to be ruled over. And they're going to be ruled over by 12 judges or 12 apostles. So if we look at uh, the last, look at the last, uh, one, two, three, four verses of Acts chapter one. They appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. I kind of think God chose Matthias because his name was easier. Justice, Barsabbas, no, Joseph, Barsabbas, Justice. That's just too much of a name to give to somebody. So he made it simple and just chose Matthias. That's all. I'm kidding, by the way. And the Bible says, and they prayed. That's important too. They prayed and did what? God said, I'm not answering your prayer. This is stupid. No, they prayed and said, thou Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. They all prayed and God answered their prayer. That, and verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go uh, to his own place. And they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. See how the Bible puts that in there? 11. It's it's undone. It's not complete. It needs that 12th man in there, okay, to, to take care of everything. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, I was going to say something really good, too, along with that. Hang on a second. I'll get it. Um, what, what was the job of the apostle anyway? Why did God call these men to be apostles? What, what was their job, if anybody knows? Huh? Um, yeah, th that that's part of it. It really is. So that's not bad. Okay, they were they were disciples of Christ, and they made disciples of Christ. But in that sense, everybody in this church is doing that. Okay, we're talking to people about the Lord. We're trying to. Show people that Jesus is the only way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by Him. And just so that everybody will know, we don't pray to the Lord Trump. Amen. i tell you what. Anyway, did you have your hand raised? I thought you were going, oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. Okay, uh, turn to uh, turn to First Corinthians twelve, I believe. First Corinthians twelve. You know what? It'd be easier if I put it up on the screen for you. Wouldn't it be easier if I did that? 
1 Corinthians 12. There is um, what, the, what people call the five-fold ministry of the church, I think. Um, yeah, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are, diver- there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Um, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Uh, let's see here. Now that's the... Uh, I can't I can't find it right here just automatically but anyway the office of apostle oh who did that I bet one of y'all did that didn't you no I think I lost it when I when I went out of full screen here it should come back on shortly anyway the office of apostle those, those men were the earthly heads of all of Christianity. Okay? You have uh, the foundation of the church. This is given to us in Revelation. That New Jerusalem, uh, a city built four square, it has 12 gates. And above each gate is the name of twelve, the twelve tribes. But it also has twelve stones. And those stones are the twelve apostles. Christ is the chief cornerstone of that. You keep scratching your head. I want to pick on you. I want to say, yes, Paige, go ahead now. Give me the answer. <clears throat> um, so the God... God gave the doctrines, the revelations, the teachings to those 12 men. That's how it all started. And it is a fallacy to believe that God gave those apostles the right to select apostles who would reign over the church when those men died that is a that is a false doctrine if you uh, meet somebody and they uh, are referred to as apostolic or apostolic they they call it that way they refer to themselves as apostolic Pentecostals that means that they believe that there are still apostles running around on the earth, that God is speaking directly to them, and that when they speak at times, that is God speaking through them, and God is still giving out teachings and doctrine. The problem with that is, it undermines Scripture. And it undermines, it goes against, the last living apostle was who? John. John was the last one. He died somewhere up in his 90s. And the book of Revelation was the last book written by any of the apostles. And it's in Revelation 22 that if any man add to the words of this book, God will add to him the plagues. If any man take away from the words of this book, I'll take his name out of the book of life. Very, very simple. And so when John died... The last apostle died. There are no more apostles. Now, um, I've run into this in Kenya. And I think I, I, think I understand um, why some of them believe the way they do. I, I've met uh, men who were referred to as this is uh, Apostle uh, uh, Jacob Omundi or whatever, okay? I've, and they, to them, that term means that they are an overseer <clears throat> of a group of men who are pastors over, over several churches. Now... I'll say this, 
there is a, uh, there's a lack of uh, Bible institutes in Kenya of, of pastoral teaching and training. Uh, I, like wh- I like what Mike Hutzel is doing over there. He's taking the ACE uh, Bible courses and he is sending them over there and he's training pastors uh, with those Bible paces. And I, and I thought, man, that is a great idea. And he holds a gra- graduation forum and, they, and I, I love it. I absolutely love it and I'm behind it 100%. And so some, some of them use the term apostle as like an overseer of various uh, pastors and so on to make sure that their faith and their doctrine is sound, okay? So I, I, don't, I don't have, uh, I'm not necessarily going after them as if they're teaching some wild, crazy unbiblical doctrine, okay? Uh, However, there are some men over there like the prophet Owar. That man is a filthy, dirty, pedophile, whoremonger. He has people that bows down to him, people that worship him, He has made claims that he can raise people from the dead. He has told his followers that he is that prophet with a capital P mentioned in Deuteronomy that God was going to send to lead the people into the promised land. And I'm like, boy, I want to say something, but I... No, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. <clears throat> if you want to know what I was going to say after church, let me, I'll let me know, I'll tell you what I was going to say. Um, but guys like that, I, I just don't bide. I just, I can't stand them. I, they're, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing, okay? So anyway, the job of the apostle, John was an apostle, Peter was an apostle, James was an apostle, Thomas was an apostle, and uh, Matthias and then Paul was, he referred to himself as one born out of season. And um, in other words, he said, I'm a late comer to this. Uh, but God called, him, Jesus himself called him personally to be an apostle uh, for Jesus Christ and for his sake. Um, and so we accept Paul's doctrine and his teaching as uh, authoritative. If Paul teaches it, it's right. It's the word of God, and we don't question it. So when you have, like the Catholic Church, they believe in apostolic succession, and they believe the chief apostle was Peter, which I will say that if you look in every list of the apostles, when the apostles are mentioned by name, uh, no matter how they are in the middle, Peter's always first, Judas is always last. That's just how it's done. And, um, and so um, the Catholic Church uses the chair of Peter or the apostleship uh, of, a, of Peter uh, as the, he is the head of all of the other popes. He is the head of all of the bishops, the cardinals, um, the cubs, the... I figured he'd get that later, but anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's what the popes believe, that since they assume the chair of Peter, uh, the bishopric of Peter, then, they, then he is selected by God to be the pope and, uh, and the head over all of the Christians in the world, which means that if the pope wants to declare something as doctrinal, and as, um, uh, I don't, can't think of the word, but anyway, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, that means that what he says is, is on the same level or even above the word of God itself, the Bible, okay? And that's what they believe. So you, you got to watch out. Some people that refer to themselves as apostle believe that, that what they come up with 
is of higher authority than the Bible itself. From such, turn away. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, back, to, um, back to Acts, chapter, uh, finishing up chapter 1 and getting into chapter 2. The lot fell upon Matthias. Uh, God, God used the lot to pick the right man. Now, we don't hear anything from Matthias after this. We don't, he, he, doesn't, he hasn't written anything in our Bibles. We don't hear of uh, what ministry he held, where he went to, what he did. We just don't know anything about him other than he's, he's mentioned as the, the 12th apostle, but it fulfills God's word. So now, uh, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, did it come back on? Yes, good. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, there's something I'm going to mention here. Three high holy days that every Jewish man had to travel to Jerusalem to attend these high holy days. What was the first one? Passover. What was the second one? Pentecost. It was 49 days, 7 times 7, and then the 50th day was, it was the Feast of Ingathering. It was when the, uh, when the, um, the crops were ripe, and it was time to gather those in, and they had a big feast and so on. And uh, if you take uh, that and you apply it to the teachings uh, that Jesus had like in Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 4 and so on about uh, all the parables he taught about the seed and the sower. Then you have the, the good seed and, the, and the, the wheat and the tares. You have the mustard seed uh, thing there in Matthew 13. And Matthew 13 is just loaded with examples of seed, sowing, reaping, harvest, things like that. Now, here's the point that I'm making. When it came time to fulfill the meaning of the Feast of Passover, God fulfilled it at Passover. When it came time to fulfill the meaning of the Feast of Pentecost, God fulfilled it at Pentecost. Now, I don't know a whole lot about the Jewish calendar. I do know that it is based upon a 360 day year and they had to do what everybody else in the world had to do at some point. They had to throw in five and a quarter days, okay, to 365.24 on and on and on days, okay? We had to, and so they had different ways that they added to the Jewish calendar to make sure that the Jewish calendar fit the motion of the sun, the moon, and the stars, okay? Uh, and that's about all I know of the Jewish calendar itself. Um, but I will tell you this. It stands to reason that when the third feast, which was what? Feast of Tabernacles. When the third feast, and it, and it being time to um, be fulfilled, I'm just going to take a guess and say that it's going to be fulfilled at the Feast of Passover time. God keeps time. He fulfills his days, he fulfills times, he fulfills seasons, he does all of those things. Now, what, what day that's going to be, I don't know. What year that's going to be, I don't know. Uh, I don't sit around and study this. I, I, I did years ago when I first started studying prophecy and uh, God said, Mike, you're not going to ever figure it out, so stop. 
So I did. I quit. I just quit looking. I quit trying to figure it out. I just, just left it up to the Lord God. It'll happen when you want it to happen. And so on and so on. But I, I do think that Christ coming, the, and the, Christ coming to fulfill the Feast of Tabernacles, I believe, will take place at Tabernacles. And what does Tabernacles mean? I, I showed you that word the other day. The word Tabernacle is related to the word tavern and uh, it literally is like a temporary dwelling place this body is a temporary dwelling place for god to live in god abides here he abides in our heart and um and that's that's the way it is but one of these days this body's going to give way we're going to get a new body and all of the things about tabernacles is going to be fulfilled uh, on that day. Whenever that day comes around, God is going to fulfill everything that he meant. He's, in fact, the word Emmanuel, I, I, always, I always thought this was kind of strange. That God told them that this child that was going to be born, his name will be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Amen. Nobody ever called him Emmanuel after that. Never. It's not written in any of the Gospels, not written by Paul, Peter, James, John. Nobody wrote or referred to Christ as Emmanuel. Did God lie? God doesn't lie. I think that name is going to be given to him at his second coming. Because then he will be God with us. Fulfilling the meaning both of the name Emmanuel and of the term tabernacle. All right. So when the day of Pentecost was uh, fully come... They were all in a Honda Accord. No, that's not, that's not what that means. That's not funny, Chris. Don't laugh at that. Yeah. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. Um... Take, turn to Revelation, uh, Revelation 6. Maybe I'm thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Look at Revelation 6. The opening of the sixth seal. And you look in uh, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a what? A mighty wind. I think, I think those two things are connected. I think the idea that a, a sound of a mighty wind is taking place, and it's foreshadowing something that is, that is going to happen in the future namely the opening of the sixth seal and the stars of heaven falling that's that's the day that we're looking for that's the day when this earth is going to be super duper mega docious deceived okay R write that down super duper mega docious deceived okay and uh, if you have any trouble spelling it ask uh Siri or whoever. Okay? Back in, back in uh, Acts now. So the, the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven. What does the word cloven mean? Split. Okay? And why, and so let's, at, let's think about this for a minute. Let's ask the question, why were they split? Why were the, why were the tongues cl 
cloven. Anybody just take a guess? Just, huh? That's good. That's really good. Okay. And now keep going from there. Huh? Hang on. Cloven. Got one here and one here. Okay? Split. Cloven. Um, so they were cloven tongues like as of fire. God's word is like a fire, he says. Okay? So his word is like a fire. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. We sort of have this idea that it's like over their heads. We don't really know, but it's, but it's there above each one of them. They all have that same thing there with them. Um, and so if you think of what fire uh, represents in the Bible, spirits are made of fire, okay? So let's, let's just take a, take a wild guess and say this is the appearance of the Holy Ghost upon all of them, and it is the appearance of a tongue because this tongue is going to be important in, in what God is going to do here, okay? And it sat upon uh, each one of them. So now in verse 4, and look, there it is. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with strange tongues, weird tongues, gibberish tongues, Garbled tongues? No. Other tongues. Other ones. Okay? Does it, does it say which ones? It just says other ones. We're going to find out which ones they are. As the Spirit gave them utterance. So let's say that you're James here. And you speak Greek and you speak a little Hebrew, but that's it. Now, all of a sudden, you speak in the language of the Egyptians. You've never studied Egyptian language. You did grow up in an Egyptian house. No one ever taught you the Egyptian tongue, but here you are, speaking it and the Holy Ghost not only is it giving you the words to speak um, but uh, the, as, as far as the the Egyptian language but he's given you the words of God are coming forth out of your mouth I mean James may have been reciting the entire book of Psalms in Egyptian, perfect Egyptian, okay? And it was like that with every one of them that was gathered in that room. So they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word gave is another, is a, is a thing here that is very important. Tongues, these tongues were a gift given to them by God. They didn't earn them. And I listen, I've, when I pastored down in, in Washington County, there's a lot of rednecks in Washington County. And there's a, there's a Pentecostal church in just about every holler that there is down there. And I've heard stories. I've heard stories. 
If you can imagine, uh, if you can imagine living in West Virginia or East Kentucky or East Tennessee in the Appalachian Mountains, okay, uh, and that and the church is there. They pull snakes out of boxes in their worship service and handle snakes. And everybody says, oh, praise the Lord. Woo! Bite out, die. Okay? Um, yeah. Uh, I heard uh, my deacon told me one time that... Uh, Somebody he knew, they, they visited this Pentecostal church down in, down in Rich Woods, down in Washington County. And when the service started, the, they, they started, they got to play loud music. They play loud music. It's always drums, bass guitar, uh, steel guitar, every, all that. And buddy, I mean, they hit it hard. And everybody gets up and starts running. And he said, everybody was running. They all ran outside and they started running around the church. What are you doing? We're running in the Holy Ghost, man. We're running. They honestly believe that the only way to get the Holy Ghost to move in their presence was to run around the church until he showed up. Okay? Listen, I'm telling you, that, number one, it's false. Number two, it's bondage. Because when God says, I'm offering you a free gift, when people turn it into a performance, a work, and all of a sudden you don't get yours, it's because you didn't do it right. You didn't run fast enough, or you didn't run around nearly as many times as somebody else did, and so therefore you're nodding your head. What do you know about this? <laughs> it is a show. Really? There, there's, there are different levels. Yeah. There are different levels, I will tell you. And like I started out tonight telling you about the Pentecostal uh, preacher that made videos against like Kenneth Hagin and those guys, um, I would say that they're fairly tame. Uh, but in, in like she saw and what I've heard of and what I experienced uh, in this town, in a Pentecostal church, I, I, knew it was, I knew it was fake. I was searching, I was looking, but I knew it was fake. I knew it was. And um, so anyway, I'm glad God didn't turn me over to that. But anyway, the bottom line is, these, these tongues were given to them, a free gift. They did not earn them. They did not have to usher them in. They, uh, I, have a, I have an old friend of mine that um, he, his salvation experience was at a Pentecostal church in this town. And uh, it was a United Pentecostal church. And when he came to the altar, uh, they pumped him full of Holy Ghost juice, I guess, and he had to, he had to say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah as many times as he could, as fast as he could, until things started just rolling out of his mouth. That's not in the Bible, that's, doesn't, that's not there. God gives it as a gift, and if you don't get it, it's it's just God saying, it's not for you, it's not for here, it's not for now. Don't feel bad, I've got other gifts to give. Okay? Uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, where he talks about, or no, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, you know, seek after uh, these spiritual gifts, but rather to prophesy. 
In other words, okay, it's great if you can uh, if you can speak in someone's language that you don't know. It's great if you can do that, but it's better if you can prophesy in a language that people understand. Much better. That way, they're, that way everybody is edified. So anyway, um, so the, uh, the verse 4 again, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men. Why were they there? Because it was the Feast of Tabernacles. They, God required them to be there three times a year uh, for uh, Passover, then Pentecost, and then a few months later, they had to come back for uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So verse 6, uh, verse 5, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, uh, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we Every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born. Parthians, I'm counting. Medes, Elamites, the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea. Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene strangers of Rome Jews proselytes Cretes and Arabians we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God that nails it as far as what were these men and I've had people tell me well, I believe that they were speaking in a heavenly prayer language, but that God had the people hearing them in their tongue. That's not what it says. And people will do that to justify the fact that they've got a secret prayer language that they speak between them and God and and. Man, I've got so much to show you on this. There are, there are teachings out there amongst the charismatic movement that say that uh, if you really want your prayers answered, you pray in God's language. And it's almost like if you don't pray in God's language, you're, not, you're probably not going to get what you asked for. Do what? Yeah. It was like, a, like you were more spiritual than everybody else because you could do it, okay? And uh, years ago, when, when we had our Christian school here, um, we had a whole group of families from a charismatic church. It used to be out on Z Highway, and, it, and I, don't think they, uh, I don't think it's the same church now, but... Uh, anyway, uh, the ladies came here one day. I don't know why they came over here, but they came over here one day because they was going to pray for me. And I said, well, okay. And um, so I, they prayed for me. And uh, then they said, now, Rodney Howard Brown's coming to town. And I knew who that was. And they said, we'd like to invite you to come and hear him. And I already knew what it was. He referred to himself, he was the Holy Ghost bartender. That was his nom de plume. I'm the Holy Ghost bartender. He would bring a drunken spirit into that church. People, people would just end up laughing uncontrollably, lay it all over the floor, laughing hysterically. He would say, joy, joy to everybody. And everybody would just be under this 
under the control of this spirit where they laughed uncontrollably. Even when the service was over, there were effects on those people. They would, they would be jolting like this for days. And I said to the ladies, ladies, I appreciate the offer, but that's, that's, not, that's not for me. And, they, and here's, listen to their condescension. They, they said, oh, we've had lots of you kind of Baptists come and meet the Holy Ghost there. Lots of your kind. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, God shielded me on that day. I can tell you that right now. Uh, as we go into this, uh, we're going to look, study, study, Gen study Genesis 11. And then Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 and Genesis 11. And, we're, and then we'll understand why God did what he did on this day. Okay? And what it was all about. Let's stand for prayer.